things get difficult for me, uh, I just pick up the phone and call John, and he's always been there for me no matter when I call. And uh, I'm very pleased to be speaking to you today about chaplains are not religious. An examination of the three core elements of support that chaplains can provide. John, I pass this over to you. Okay. So, just so everybody's aware, what's going around right now is a handout. Please make sure that you add one, and I said that like I'm down east, have one. And on the back of it, you have some notes. I do, I am not interested in you wasting your afternoon, especially at this nap time. So what I want to do is I want to walk you through a couple little things. And the previous speaker talked about servant leadership. I want to give you a visual because if you look at the actual origin of the word servant, it's the same root word as the word humility. Many people mistranslate humility today as doormat. If you want a visual, and I teach through visuals because I'm not interested in being clinical, when I teach through visuals, humility, and this is Nufi wisdom, and if you've ever worked with a Nuf, well, anyways, I'll carry on. God bless you if you haven't, because you have not lived. <laughs> humility is a stallion under a bitten bridle. And what we have mistranslated humility as is, well, after 29 years, yes, dear, yes, dear, yes, that's not humility. That's obedience. And we, there are the lowest form of leadership that that chief just spoke to is the positional leadership. How many of you have a biological reflex that when somebody, you see their number extension, whatever, on your screen, you have that biological reflex that says, and I'm going to go G-rated, <sighs> them. <laughs> that is the art of leadership, folks. I'm going to be really blunt with you because I'm going to try something different. I'm going to speak about challenging your thinking. You ever noticed how mental health is the only disease where people get mad at the person? Think about it. I'm old enough to remember the training that when you started, when we started with suicide, don't mention the word, you put the idea in their head, oh, balderdash. But some of you are of an expression of faith that if I kill myself years ago, I get a ticket, do not pass go, do not collect $200, I even get buried outside the fence. You want to know, if I die of cancer, the number of people who line up for cancer fundraisers, if I died of a heart attack, Heart and Stroke Foundation, mental health, by the way, mentally healthy people do not kill themselves. It is the only disease where people get mad at the person. And what we have to start doing is calling it for what it is. It's a psychological Charlie horse. Is there anybody in this room, I did actually meet somebody who did not have a Charlie horse. Is there anybody who has never had the Charlie horse? You know when some twit of a coach says, oh, just get back on the field, walk it off, you're fine to quote Monty Python, it's just a flesh wound. And, and you know what? It doesn't make it go away. Why is it when somebody gets a wallop, a psychological charley horse, we treat them different? And if you want to know an emotional charley horse, unfriend a tween from Facebook. <laughs> it's a charley horse, folks. There are impacts and there is a physical charley horse. There is an emotional memory pretending it's not there anymore. I can still feel it, and I can still tell you, back in the days when we called our coaches Mr. and Mrs., I can still tell you Mr. Allen saying to me, oh, John, and I was raised in a strong Scottish home, okay? That was a hug. If you're going to cry, I'll bloody well give you something to cry about. You know, all the things that, and I actually started out my parenting, there's no blood, Amanda, until that day there was blood. That was how I started. So I'm not talking to you as somebody, oh, that's too bad, oh. And I see them still going around. Is everybody still got a, getting a handout? They are missing some. There's some at the back. There will be some coming around. Because one of the things that I don't know how you are going to be able to address 
life if you are not willing to talk about beliefs. I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to be the little boy in the emperor's new clothes. I'm sorry, I'm not going to pretend it's magical thread. I have no problems being an idiot and saying, but he's naked. Or he's not wearing it, or whatever the thing is. So I would like to propose to you, how are you going to talk to somebody that a woman is not allowed to do what she wants to do because of that expression of faith if you are not going to talk about beliefs? How do you do that? And I would propose to you that the beliefs are the things that we have been indoctrinated, I would say drank the Kool-Aid, that we're not supposed to talk about. Beliefs always give birth to values. Always. If I believe I am, you can kiss the ring on my finger, type of person, it's all about me, by the way. This is not, do not judge me. But I actually said those words to my wife. It's not always about they had that was just it's a bummer of a birthmark but one of the problems that I had in the culture that I was raised in show no emotion so when my wife got really upset with me and I know what it was and it's none of your business <laughs> and it was in our first six months of marriage when she said those words, started showing emotion, I did what I always do. I put on my game face and said, call your parents. Actually, she packed her suitcases <laughs> and said, I can't do this. And because I'm a kind, loving, professional, I carried her suitcases down and put them in the car and said, I'll call your folks. <laughs> We were living in Cape Breton, by the way. That's a 21-hour drive. <laughs> the only thing, and I would propose to you, and this is speaking directly to beliefs, I would propose to you that God saved my marriage. I don't care what your belief is. You all have a belief in something. If you believe your supervisor, manager, leader is out to get you, welcome to being a believer. We all got beliefs. So when my wife laughed because she was so angry and she was raised in the thumper school, you know that if you can't say something nice, you shouldn't say nothing at all. So she laughed. The heater core let go in our Ford Taurus. So she was coming back as the, I don't know what you call it, dry ice smoke, but it was all billowing out the windows. So I would propose to you that the heater core saved our marriage. She came back and we... I had to man up, come out from underneath the bed, and face her like, face her like a man, face me like, uh, face her like a man. So why am I sharing that with you? People, we have been taught not to talk about beliefs. If I believe it's all about me, then my values are going to be the easiest ones in the world to negotiate with. It's all about me. Do you know what people are called when it's all about them? Selfish. And as Canadians, we got to get over this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. By the way, if you want to have fun with people, when they bump into you, just look at them. <laughs> it is as good as getting on an elevator, and instead of turning around like the lights are going to do something they've never done before, get on and just look at people. <laughs> I was downtown Toronto, a guy... We, uh, a guy got off on the seventh floor. We stopped on the 14th or 15th floor, and I said, is somebody getting off? And a voice at the back said, the guy that got off on the seventh, this was his stop. <laughs> People are so uncomfortable with being authentic, being just, hello. Oh, what's the matter with you? Values, selfish people, are the easiest people in the world to negotiate with. It's all about them, and it's all about them saving money or making money. Easiest people in the world. If I don't know what my values are, the best way to figure them out, crisis. When it hits the fan, and I've been doing crisis work since 1988. I started when I was three. When 1988, Westray, or 1989, I can't remember the exact year, Westray mine disaster. 
And my friends were Dragomen, which is the mine rescue guys. They, they do the, it's no longer extrication. And they came back FUBAR. And if you know anything about the Maritimes, keg debriefs are the debriefing model of choice. And we came back and we had to start walking through this stuff. And first things first, when I say the word chaplain prod, padre, what comes to your mind? Pardon me? Father. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm... Got white collar. Oh, white collar? Actually, I'm, just to show you, I wanted to wear a robe, but I keep tripping <laughs> over the hem, so... <laughs> Do you know what, folks? Religion is the man-made, human-made manifestation of beliefs. Let me repeat something. Religion is the human manifestation of a belief system. Chaplains are the only organized entity that they have to be a member of a profession, and that's why it's highlighted on your page because they have to be accountable. I can't go into your organization and say, God has called me to help you. <coughs> I have to be accountable to somebody. But it is the only person that goes in to help you deal with your beliefs. It is not about indoctrination. It is not about growing my religion, my church. And where we run into huge cluster moments when chaplain padres get involved is they get about convicting. You know, maybe God has taken this child. You know what? When I hear that kind of crap, I want to play bingo. The five under the eye, for those of you who don't know that model. But one of the things that we have to understand is it is about people who believe in God. Now where we get into debate and religion is what is God for you? But you know what? We can have unity once we start to realize we both have a belief system instead of worrying about whether you stand up, put your hands in the air, or whether you kneel down. I don't care how you do that part of it. How does your beliefs teach you what are your values about treating other people? And we have to start learning to be comfortable with this. Part of the reason that I enjoy crisis work is I love when I, because I don't have to worry about talking about the weather. And as much as I loved the last seven games, mm -hmm. even though they had a rain delay on one particular night and it went on till midnight, I really do enjoy those kinds of games. But I'd rather talk about something just a little more important than the Cubs or the Indians. And so when we're talking about it, the longest journey in the world is 12 inches. We live in a culture right now that is transfer of information oriented. That does not result in transformation. Longest journey in the world is taking what we know and making it the way we are. In 995 BCE, there was a line written that said, to the writing of books there is no end. 995 BCE. Folks, we have to start doing, and it's a ripple effect of what we're talking about. Start with what is under our control. My wife says she has four kids. Together we have three kids. But one, one of them is married. One of them did boomerang. And his contract ended at a camp he was at. And you know what? He had to leave a job because the values of the leadership and his values were not on the same page. So let me propose something to you. If you are not clear on what your values are, how do you evaluate anything? Just think about it. If I don't know what my values are, how do I evaluate? And if you want a visual, for values, go to the old baseball bat. I have, that was one of my traumatic memories. You know the baseball, when you're picking teams and you go up the bat and the one at the hand of the top gets first pick? One of my traumatic events was, you can have John. No, you can have John. No, 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 it's your pick. 
So I'm trying not to go too far down that visual. But integrating the information into real life, folks. How do you do that? Telling our kids, and I was listening to a conversation at the table. You know what? Sometimes you're not going to get a trophy. And I know it's not best practice. But in our house, one of the lines is, guys, don't forget, if the world didn't suck, we'd all fall off. And sometimes, <laughs> I told you, I'm not the model of perfect. But let me give you the visual for resilience. If I say one word, I want you to think what comes to mind. Weebles. Weebles wobble. What is resilience? The weebling. My, I'm old enough to remember a bot bag, which was about four, mine was Bozo the Clown, but it was about four feet, sand or water in the bottom. When life does this, can I stand back up? That's resilience. And it keeps moving it forward, so when life hits me, I stand up over here. That's a new norm, because what used to make the radar now doesn't really bother me. And so when we're talking about factors of resilience, I want you to notice something, folks. These are not American stats. These are Canadian. 59% are more likely to seek support from a spiritual person compared to 45% MDs, 40% mental health professionals. That is only referring to mental health professions who get what you're dealing with. And the barometer for that, by the way, is how do they respond to dark humor? March 2015, 73% believed in God or higher power. On the other hand, 81% 15 years ago. One of the signs of resilience is delayed gratification. I wonder if we move from emotional regulation, delayed gratification, diminishing, and a belief in God, and by the way, I haven't even told you if I'm a chaplain or I have credentials or any of that stuff. I'm talking about beliefs compared to 30% in 2000, 23% today. That's the religious the church, what I would call in my tradition, it was a church attendance, synagogue, temple, mosque. Now, we've heard a lot about this, but what I'd like you to note in this, please, is most conversations, and Gary started it because he raised the bar by lowering it. He started by sharing vulnerability. This is by a Dr. John Powell, and he talks about cliche. Number one conversation in North, in North America, I would say Canada, weather. I had to do a next to kin one day, and there was a poster on the side of the door of this house, and I was notifying them about their dad, and it said, don't complain about the weather. Without it, 95% of Canadians would have nothing to talk about it. Do you know what we were talking about within 10 minutes of me telling them their dad was dead? The weather. Fact, sharing what I know. <coughs> now, what I want you to note is degree of transparency and number of people. Numbers of people diminish as we move down to vulnerability. What this boils down to is, by the way, this opinion right here, sharing what we think. If you want a visual for that one, Sports Talk Radio. It's just our opinions. I wouldn't go that far. It, it's not, okay? Emotions, sharing how we feel. My daughter and I have the same personality type, and it's so when we get greeted with the words, so how do you feel? We kind of do the dog, and, you know, you make a strange sound to a dog, they do that. Good. Because we don't process through that lens. Vulnerability is sharing what I need. Now, what I want you to note in this is it leaves.